أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I really love this du'a. So I want to begin with this du'a. It's the du'a of Musa alayhi salam. And this is the du'a that Musa alayhi salam said when he was going to face Pharaoh. And that was, you know, the biggest uh, struggle that he was going to have to do. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up his chest and to remove the knot and to make his matters easy and to remove the knot from his tongue. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the same. And the topic for today is, um, it's kind of a topic of, uh, you know, the, the, the title is, I'm trying but I keep messing up. And the idea of this topic is it's it's the um, sort of the psyche of a person who feels like every time, you know, you try in something, say you're trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you're trying to uh, work on your, your deen, you're trying to get, you know, be a better Muslim, you're trying to be better at whatever it is that you're trying to get better at. And specifically on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you get to points where you keep, um, you know, you keep falling, you keep tripping, you keep messing up. And it sometimes it gets very frustrating. Uh, it, you know, this idea is that the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed to be a linear upward path where we start, you know, once we realize whether it's through like, you know, we convert to Islam um, or we, you know, get to a point in our life where now we are going to be, you know, we, we change our ways and we're like, you know, now I'm going to be a good Muslim. I'm going to focus my efforts on developing myself um, in, in my Islamic identity. And we think that now once we start walking forward, that it's just going to be linear. It's just going to be upward and it's going to be linear and there's not going to be any dips. And this is a, this is a, this is totally false. And in fact, this idea of, of the path being linear and not having any dips and, and just being upward is something that can be very dangerous because what happens is then once you do slip up, once you do, uh, you know, get to that sort of that dip in the road, you start to become hopeless. And, and one of the things that happens whenever you start on this path there is like this first awakening period. Uh, this is kind of like what you would consider uh, the so-called revert or convert, you know, fervor, you know, that passion that you usually see in a, in a new revert or convert to Islam where there's so much, uh, it becomes, there's so much passion and, there, and, and it becomes almost easy to do all these extra things. It's easy to sacrifice. It's easy to pray. It's easy to even, you know, to put on hijab, to pray qiyam. And, and it's because there's like this, almost this, this, this spiritual high that you're in. And what happens during that period of time, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't, it's not only for people who accept Islam, uh, you know, leave another religion, accept Islam, but even people who are born Muslim reach this period in time as well. It's sort of like an awakening to their Islamic identity. And while they're in that state, it's very easy to be, um, there's like all this motivation. Uh, it seems like uh, worship becomes easier. And this is actually a natural consequence of that state, which which um, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah refers to as yaqadha, which means awakening. And that's the very first station on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that state, you tend to fall into, uh, because it's so easy for you, sometimes you tend to fall into uh, belittling or looking down on other people. And unfortunately, that's one of the possible side effects of the ease with which you find yourself worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during that temporary state. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is, this is something that we want to avoid, right? Because we, if we realize first that that state is temporary, that spiritual high, that ease, uh, is something that it's, it's part of the path, but it's a temporary part. And so when we, when we see other people who may be struggling while, while we ourselves are not struggling, we should never look down on them for a few reasons. One is that whatever ease we have at that point is not from ourselves. It's not because I'm a better person. It's not because I deserve it. It's not because I worked really hard for it, but it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we should never feel, we should never feel arrogant or self-satisfied about it, uh, but rather we should be very grateful. And at the same time, realizing that it's something temporary, it isn't 
a lasting state that is inherent in myself because I deserve it. It's not. It's not like that. It's um, it's something that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives, and it's part of the path, but it's 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 temporary. And after this this period of time, which is sort of the the yaqadha, the awakening period, after that comes the dip. And that dip is also part of the path. And this is what a lot of people don't realize is it's called that 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 futur, which is the the dip, the in when that high uh you lose that high. And now all of a sudden it's not as easy to wake up for Fajr. It's not as easy to keep your hijab on. It's not as easy anymore to pray Qiyam. It's Now it starts to be a little bit more of a struggle. A lot of times what happens at this point is people start to become hopeless. They realize, they, I mean, they think, oh, you know, like I'm messing up. Uh, I'm not able to do what I did. And now you start to kind of give up. And that's where it's very dangerous. If you were, if you think that you're always supposed to be uh, perfect. If you're always supposed to, you're never supposed to make mistakes, you're never supposed to fall, then the reason why that thinking is very dangerous, besides making you arrogant, is it actually leads to hopelessness. Because you will inevitably make mistakes, and you will inevitably trip, and you will inevitably fall. And when you do, because you're human, you tend to fall into hopelessness. So it's actually very detrimental to have this concept of goodness equating um or rather equating goodness with perfection it's very very important that we realize that goodness does not mean perfection and it cannot mean perfection because we're human goodness rather is the fact and in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah when he describes the people of jannah when he describes those who will get to jannah he describes them as people as as people who repent as people who when they make a mistake when they when they when they um you know oppress their own selves they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's part of being a good person is tawbah is coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's humbling yourself it's not being perfect it's not never making a mistake so n- realizing that actually prevents you from from becoming hopeless once that does happen and i think that this whole idea um this whole idea of perfection is actually uh, also something that shaitan uses against us. And I'll explain why. Uh, when you think of, for example, this happens a lot with hijabis, with, with, with sisters who either want to wear hijab or already do wear hijab. Uh, a lot of times one of the tricks of shaitan is this, is he'll tell, you know, he'll, he'll whisper to you, because of this idea of perfection, that uh, you really shouldn't wear hijab until first you become perfect. So this idea of like, I need to be an, a, a saint first, right? I need to be an angel first before I put on hijab. It's like hijab is this this seal. Hijab is kind of this destination that once you've perfected everything else, then you wear hijab. And and really, you know, I don't, the idea, uh, I don't know where that idea even comes from because hijab is just like any other act of, of ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like any other act of obedience where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to fast in Ramadan or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to give sadaqah, to give zakah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to treat our families well. Allah you know, these are the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And out of obedience to him, we obey these these commands. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to act a certain way and to dress a certain way. And so it's just another um, act of obedience when we, when, we, when we wear hijab or when we act a certain way. And so we shouldn't you know, see it as some sort of, uh, it's like a seal of being angelic or something. And, and, and the idea here is then what happens with that is it's, many things start to happen as a result of believing that. One is that you, it becomes a barrier from you to wear hijab because shaitan will come at you and say, oh, like, who, you know, you're, you're not good enough. <laughs> you're not really, you know, you first have to work on all these other things before you are um, kind of like uh, worthy enough to wear hijab. Which is very strange because hijab should be an, an enabler because, you know, one of the things that hijab does is it actually protects you. It actually serves as uh, sort of like an extra barrier between you and the haram. And, and this isn't to say you can't commit haram. I mean, of course, people do still commit haram while wearing hijab, but it is that extra barrier Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. So it actually should be an enabler to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should be a means and a tool to help you get there. Uh, rather than just you know just a seal once you're already there, so this this idea again uh, it also makes us very intolerant when we see, for example, a hijabi 
who is um, maybe she's she's you know she's not doing the best job or she's not being quote unquote the best Muslim people are very judgmental of her more so than they would be uh, of somebody who isn't wearing hijab and and you know that doesn't really make it nobody says that once you wear hijab you all of a sudden transform into an angel you're still a human being uh, and and just like other people you still have your weaknesses and you still have your faults so the idea is that it's just another act um, that we're trying you know that someone tries towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for example, salah. You know, a lot of times you hear this this um, this idea of, I mean, I've heard this before where you don't want to, one of the things with regards to hijab is, I, you know, there's this idea of not wanting to wear hijab or being afraid to wear hijab lest you take it off. So the the fear is that I, I don't want to, again, that idea, I have to be completely um, perfect and angelic and strong and completely, you know, it, it has to be totally set before I wear it because I'm afraid I'll take it off. But but even that idea, why is it why is it better to not wear it at all than to wear it and take it off? And you know, you just you just think again. It's this concept of expecting perfection, and we're so afraid of falling short of perfection. But what we really need to be afraid of is not turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once we fall short of perfection because it's a fact that we will fall short uh, you look at the story of Adam alayhi salam such a beautiful lesson in the story of Prophet Adam that Prophet Adam once he you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him and told Hawa not to eat from the tree and it was only after he did eat from the tree that he realized something very very profound inna zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasirin here adam ali prophet adam alayhi salam realizes and and Hawa realize that we have wronged our own selves and if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us we will indeed be among the losers look at this realization it's only by you know quote unquote messing up that you really realize how much you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you how much you need the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we never made mistakes we might believe that we don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we might believe that we you know we don't we might not realize our a desperate need for him rather um you know one of the the most dangerous states to be in actually is when you don't see your own mistakes you don't see your own faults you don't see your own weaknesses and you think of yourself instead as um being really holy right being really righteous and so this is actually one of the most dangerous states to be in uh this concept of self-admiration and and you might even be doing good deeds you might even be doing them but the problem is that you see your good deeds and you see them and you're pleased with yourself and what it does is it uh, creates a sense of pride in you a, cre- a sense of arrogance and that's extremely dangerous one that does what that does is it actually uh, keeps you from getting uh, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from, conti- from continuing on the path because you think you're okay. You think you're, you know, you're good. I'm, I'm better than that person, so I'm fine. Um, and, and two, this disease of self-admiration, this disease of arrogance is the same disease that destroyed shaitan. So we should be very, very afraid of this type of disease. Uh, and, and, and even when we look at the story of shaitan, shaitan, I mean, subhanAllah, shaitan worshipped Allah. I mean, this is, this is the thing that we really have to understand. It wasn't that shaitan wasn't doing quote unquote good deeds. It was that shaitan was inf- infected with the disease of arrogance. And he thought that he was better than Adam. And, and, and because of that arrogance, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to do something, even though he was a worshiper, even though he believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not obey him because of that arrogance. And moreover, he despaired in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah, you know, when, when Adam did what he was not supposed to do, when Adam slipped, his immediate reaction after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him what to say, his reaction was remorse. His reaction was tawbah. His reaction was to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in humility. But look at the reaction of shaitan. You know, shaitan made a mistake. Yes, he disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, but couldn't he have repented? Couldn't he have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness? Would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not have forgiven him? When Allah says that if you come to him, he's willing, he will forgive sins even if they take up the, 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 the area 
between the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he, will for, he, can, he can forgive even if that's how much you have of sin. So had shaitan wanted, had shaitan humbled himself and, and sought the, the, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have forgiven him. But he didn't have that attitude. He had a very different attitude. His attitude was one of rebellion and arrogance. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that type of attitude when we slip. Uh, so we're talking today about the, uh, the, the concept of, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm struggling, I'm trying to better myself, but I keep messing up. And, and is, this, is this something that's unusual? Is this something that, that only some people deal with? And, and, and what, we're, what we're really getting at is the heart of being human is messing up. The heart of being human is the fact that we are not we are not perfect. And so much, uh, I think there are so much of the way we teach Islam, the way we, we, we understand Islam, that we need to unlearn. One of the things which seems to be prevalent in the way we understand and teach Islam is this concept of perfection, that you're not going to be worthy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy you're not going to be worthy of being considered a religious good person unless you can be perfect. And this is completely wrong. And, and it's, it's impossible to ever be perfect, obviously, as a human being. And if you ever do reach that point where you think you're perfect, you've got major issues. Um, you have more issues than, than if you, you know, you knew you weren't perfect and you weren't because the idea now is you're dealing with arrogance. You're dealing with a deeper and more dangerous, uh, disease of self admiration. If you think that you are perfect, or that you know you're you're pleased with with where you're at or where or who you you know um the deeds that you're doing you're 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 focused on them and you're and it's making you proud uh then we have a more serious problem and and that's where we get into the concept of purification uh this is a disease of the heart itself so what we have to do as we're striving towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we're trying to better ourselves and worship him better and purify ourselves we have to be very careful of what of what it means to be good of what it means uh to be a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and ultimately what it means is that I am going to mess up and I am in desperate need of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the acceptance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without those things, I'm completely doomed. I'm completely, I, my deeds can't do anything for me without those things. And that's the problem here is that we, even as, you know, the religious, so-called religious Muslims, we depend on our deeds. We think that, you know, it's, it's almost like if we were given a choice, uh, you know, do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And people have, you know, we know a hadith that, that the man was given a choice. Do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to... Um, you know, do you want it to be based on your deeds that you enter paradise or based on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, you know, the one who thinks that they have, you know, some good amount of, of deeds, they might choose their deeds. But even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that he will not enter Jannah by his deeds, but only by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to be very, very careful that as we take this path to Allah, that we don't become pleased with our with ourselves, we don't become arrogant, and we never think that no matter, you know, the thing is, no matter what we do of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to always realize that it's never what He deserves, right? It's always going to be insufficient, and that's why, you know, even when we finish salah, salah is one of the greatest acts of ibadah. And yet when we finish salah, we're taught to say astaghfirullah, 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 immediately after we finish. Astaghfirullah, meaning we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We're asking for forgiveness right after we do an act of ibadah. It seems like a contradiction, right? But why are we doing that? Because no matter what we do, no matter what, you know, uh, ibadah we do, it will never be as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. It will never be perfect. It will always be um, insufficient in some way. And yet, and yet, and this is why we don't become hopeless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is infinitely merciful. So he still accepts these insufficient and incomplete acts of ibadah that we present him with but we just have to be you know see this is the thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive and cover and erase our sins but our job is to keep striving but at the same time to seek that forgiveness and to seek that acceptance not to not to think that 
um, you know, I'm getting into, I'm getting what I'm getting because I deserve it. But rather we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify the insufficiencies that we have and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover up the faults that we have. And, and we, we see that's all we have. That's all we have is His forgiveness. That's all we have is His mercy. Uh, we, we definitely can't depend on ourselves. We definitely can't depend on our insufficient deeds. We need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And never lose hope. You are going to go up and down in your faith. You are going to go up and down in your ability to worship Allah. You're going to go up and down. Your iman is never going to be stable. No state in this life is ever stable. And so, so things are going to go up and down. But never lose hope when you fall down. Never lose hope when you're at a low. Always keep going. Don't give up. And, and the main thing, you know, even the Prophet ﷺ, when he talked about futur, he talked about this dip in iman and in our worship. He said, as long as you're, when you're in futur, you're in that low, in that dip, you are still on the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, then you'll be okay. So even when you are in that low, that iman low or whatever it is that you're going through, even when you're there, as long as you force yourself, even though it's hard at that point, to keep going. And at least, at least you don't compromise the obligatory things, that you don't compromise your salah, you don't compromise these things, and you just keep on going. And eventually you get out of that dip and you go back up. And this is just the sunnah of life. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, أَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ يا أيها الإنسان إنك كادح إلى ربك كدحا فملاقي. O mankind, you are toiling, ever toiling towards your Lord, but you shall meet Him. So it is this constant toil. It's this constant up and down. It's a struggle. Yes, it is. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that it is, but eventually you meet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And we just have to keep begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy and his acceptance and his forgiveness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from our own selves, our own weaknesses, our own nafs, and from shaitan. And, and so looking at some of the questions that, that people have been asking, uh, there's a number of questions that were um, regarding hijab, for example, asking how can you... Uh, for example, convince someone to wear hijab or how can you get the, basically, how is it, how, how do you get the courage to wear hijab? And I think that anytime we ask a question um, like this about hijab or otherwise, you know, wearing hijab or not wearing hijab is really, um, it's kind of like a symptom of, a, of another issue. Everything that we do externally is a reflection of what we are internally. Uh, and so when we look at how we are in our actions or how we are externally, we have to see it as rooted inside. So if I'm having, for example, I'm, have, I'm really struggling with something, that's a sign that there's something internally that I need to work on. So for example, if I'm really, really struggling with giving up um, something which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I'm, I'm having really a lot of trouble. Str I'm struggling to lower my gaze, for example, or I'm struggling to give up a, a haram relationship, or I'm struggling to give up, uh, you know, haram, maybe I'm a haram um, income or, or a job where which involves riba or any of these things. If I'm really having a lot of trouble with that or I'm struggling to wear hijab, I have to look internally and see what is it inside of me that's making this so difficult. And a lot of times what it comes down to is uh, w my attachments. A lot of times it comes down to what is it that I love most. And, and these things that happen in our lives are really just to show us what we need to work on inside. They're a reflection of what we are inside. And therefore it points out those diseases, if you will, internally that need to be addressed. So maybe if I'm having trouble with my salah or I'm having trouble with hijab, for example, it, maybe it means that I am too attached to what society thinks of me. Maybe it's because I'm too attached to um, seeking a certain type of attention or, or maybe I don't feel uh, enough, uh, I don't feel enough value in, in myself that I need to be uh, valued, I need to get that certain type of attention in order to feel valued. So again, it, it can, a lot of times, it, it can stem from an internal um, place that we're at. 
And sometimes, you know, it, it, it depends, you know, sometimes it's other things. But what we really have to do is every individual person needs to look internally and see what is the what is the source uh, of this struggle that I'm going through or, you know, this masiya, maybe this sin that I'm continuously uh, committing against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so with, with regards to hijab, for example, you know, the hijab, putting on the hijab is going to become a lot easier when I've built my relationship with Allah and I have a, a close relationship with Him. You know, love and obedience come hand in hand. The more that you love someone, the more that you want to please them. And, and when you do love someone and you are in love with someone, everything they tell you, you know, you, you just, you hear and you obey. You want to do what they, what they want, what they love. You want to make them happy. You want them to be pleased with you. And so the more that we love Allah, the more that we build that strong attachment to Him through the ibadah, through salah, through dhikr, through the remembrance of Allah, then, you know, you don't need to force someone to wear hijab after that. You don't need to convince them to wear hijab after that. As soon as they know this is what my, the one that I love wants, they do it, you know, and this is, again, it comes as a consequence of love uh, and, and a consequence of fear because when you love someone, your greatest fear is to displease them. When you love someone, your greatest fear is for them to cut you off, for them to want to have nothing to do with you, for them to say, um, you know, like, I don't know you anymore, right? For them, for them to disown you. That's your greatest fear when you love someone. So our fear when, we, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our greatest fear is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be displeased with us. That Allah would come on the day of judgment and say that he doesn't want to speak to us. That he doesn't want to see us. And that there's a veil put between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be our greatest fear. And that comes as a consequence of love. That comes as a consequence of of building that nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that relationship. So again, I think we we, we go through things sort of from the outside in and it really should be from the inside out that that the more uh you know for example when you look at what were the first um Aisha radiallahu anha said that had the first revelation been uh not to drink not to commit fornication these things nobody would have been able to do it no one would have done it and yet the first revelation to these to to, to the people was about the day of judgment was about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was about la ilaha illallah was about tawhid and and because because Allah, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom, he knew that, that these people, that when you come at people with just rules, you come at people with haram and halal, that it's, it's you know, people are going to be like, no way. But if you come at people from the heart and you come at people from, you, you tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Allah? What is the day of judgment? What's going to happen to them after they die? And you, and you go at it from internally those other things become easy. They become a consequence of love. Obedience is a consequence of love. Inshallah, I'm going to go ahead and take another short break and I'll look over the questions. And when we return, we will continue on the topic of I'm trying, but I keep messing up. Uh, we are speaking today about uh, the concept of sin, the concept of imperfections, when we're trying and we keep messing up. And uh, some of the questions, I've taken a look at some of the questions. So one of the questions asks uh, or says, but on the other hand, there are some sisters who don't take their, uh, who don't value their hijab. It's sometimes very sad to see how sisters behave while wearing hijab, how they behave with the opposite sex, having haram relationships. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. While this is a very valid point, my question is, is it better if people are doing that and behaving that way without hijab? Does that make the action better? And this is exactly my point, is that um, the action doesn't become worse because the person is wearing hijab. And that's where we have this idea in our mind, where we hold a hijabi to a higher standard than we would a non-hijabi. And that doesn't make any sense because both are human beings, both are Muslims, both say la ilaha illallah. And so to say that, well, it's it's worse for a hijabi to do it than a non-hijabi. I, I I don't know of any any ruling that that says that that um, yes, there is obviously the issue of 
um, the the example for other people. But suppose you're doing it in private. Uh, it, it's not worse for you because you're wearing the hijab. You know, this is what we have to understand that we all are held accountable. We all, you know, the you know, it's like we we all uh, we're all Muslim. You know, if we say La ilaha illallah, we all have the same responsibility. You know, and then there was another uh, point, another comment where someone said that when somebody takes hijab, they're taking on a responsibility. Yes, this is true. They're taking on a responsibility in terms of uh, being an example externally for Islam and, you know, may Allah reward and, and, and guide us all. But at the same time, we all have taken on a responsibility. We, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has taken a covenant with every human being. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And every single human being, every soul said, Bala shahidna. Yes, in, yes, we, we bear witness. And so every single person, every human has taken on a responsibility. Are we taking, are we really fulfilling that responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are we really fulfilling that responsibility to worship him and him alone no Allah you know we're falling short we all are falling short and so we have to stop pointing fingers and and really look internally what are we doing what how how is it that we can improve you know really we subhanallah we we have to realize that the way in which we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with us is the way we need to deal with other people. If we look at other people and we're so quick to want to, you know, hold them accountable, so quick to criticize, so quick to put them down, you know, that that we, we don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to hold us to that, you know, and we're so, we're so slow to forgive people, right? You know, oh, they did this to me or they, you know, and we want to really... We want to exact, you know, re- revenge and we want to like hold on to things. And yet when we turn to Allah, we want him to be very different with us. Imagine for a moment if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treated us the way we treat other people. Imagine for a moment if Allah held us accountable for everything that we did and and refused to forgive us and wanted to exact, you know, a retribution for every wrong that we did. We would be doomed. And this is the idea that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, and his messenger teach us that, that if, you know, have mercy on the people, uh, you know, have mercy on, on, on the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you. This is the, this is the, uh, the lesson. This is the, the concept that how we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with us is how we should be with the creation. If we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to overlook our, our many many faults we need to be that way towards people we need to stop being so intolerant and so narrow and subhanallah it is it is a disease in and of itself that we point to other people but we don't see the faults in ourselves and so we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove that veil and to allow us to be among those people who are self-critical who look internally and who realize that the biggest Fir'aun, the biggest tyrant is within us, is within our own selves. Aquli qawli hadha wa astaghfar Allah li wa lakum innahu ghafurun rahim. Subhanakallah wa bihamdak. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk.